Hey guys, don't forget the 2023 Street Cop Training Conference, Nashville, Tennessee, April 23rd through the 28th. You do not want to miss this so far. Guest speakers, Rob O'Neill, the Navy SEAL that was responsible for killing Osama bin Laden. Kyle Carpenter, U.S. Marine, Medal of Honor recipient, jumping on an IED to protect his platoon. Fox News host Tommy Lahren returns for 2023. Sheriff Wayne Ivey, Sheriff Mark Lamb, Sheriff David Clark, and more to come. You don't want to miss this event. We additionally have 20 of the country's top law enforcement educators giving you the best experience of your life. You will leave this event knowing more about your job and how to be proficient at the things that you do, hands down, than any other event that you'll ever attend. I personally guarantee it. Don't miss out. There's a room code at streetcop.com for our room block and room code at the Gaylord at Opry is where the event's taking place. Don't miss out on a discounted rate. The rate is from Sunday to Thursday. Put that in and find yourselves at a half-price room. Split it with a friend, but make sure you get there. You don't want to miss this event. It is going to be that good. If you trust me and you trust Street Cop, trust that you will leave there feeling like you've had an experience of a lifetime. Hey guys, welcome to this episode of the Street Cop Training Podcast. We host founder and CEO of Street Cop Training. My name is Dennis Benino. I have today a very special guest who's going to give us a lot of value and input, especially from the law enforcement community, on health, sleep, diet, all these things that are important that we really try to push on the, on the culture of law enforcement so we can improve. And you'd be surprised how it correlates to your performance in the field when you start taking care of yourself. But without any further ado, and with uh, all the thanks in the world, just want to say welcome to the program, Dr. Kyle Gillette. And maybe you can give the law enforcement community and the non-law enforcement community who subscribes to this some insight as to who you are. Thanks. Um, great to be on. As far as my background, I am dual board certified in obesity medicine and family medicine. And one of my main areas of emphasis is hormone health. I'm from Kansas City, and um, I've always kind of known that I wanted to be a uh, a physician that practices health optimization that doesn't just help people prevent pathology, but that helps people achieve optimal cognitive and athletic performance. Sometimes the analogy I use is that, you know, if you have a car and you want to drive your car to work back and forth, whatnot, you can take it to Jiffy Lube, get an oil changed, maybe get it checked over every once in a while. But if you want that car to perform, then you need to go to a different mechanic in order to achieve that. It's so interesting as you're saying this stuff. I think it's kind of serendipitous that we're here today because Literally, if we go through the history of my phone searching over the past couple of days, I'm looking for personally sports dietitians, athletic dietitians to try to optimize myself as well as I continue on this path into my 40s and um, really want to continue to take care of the machine and even make it even better and fine tuning it. Now, I, I guess we'll start this by talking a little bit about our community and some of the things that people deal with as far as law enforcement officers are. And I'll paint a little context of what life is like for a cop now in modern day America. Number one, obviously, it's not hard to tell the stresses of the job in the eyes of the media and how they're scrutinized. Number two, the stresses of the job that are actually the job. That includes the dynamics of the things that we see and experience. Uh, and a lot of that stuff, the worst stuff of that comes from the inside internal administrations uh, of the police agencies. And the last one, which I think you're going to find the most interesting, is trying to design a lifestyle around sometimes shift work, overnights to day work, to being so low on manpower now nationally that men and women are being forced to work 16, 18 hour shifts, seven days a week, um, yeah. sometimes at night, not being able to find food and not having the time now even to prepare for time on the road and prep meals and things like that, that they're going to have to go find whatever they can find to try to find some kind of substance to keep them moving forward. The bangs, the Red Bulls, 7-Eleven, the soda, all that stuff. We'll start there and how that impacts what's happening in their lives. So take it away, Doc. Yeah, this would be uh, one of the professions that it's pretty much impossible to get all of your lifestyle pillars. Lifestyle pillars, by the way, are just things that you do like diet, exercise, sleep, 
stress control that help with hormone health and overall health in general. And they're more powerful than any medication or supplement. So those lifestyle interventions are particularly difficult um, in the law enforcement community. Recently, I gave a CME talk at a conference of sports dietitians. I believe it's the CSPDA, um, but it's the Collegiate and Sports Dietitians Association. Many of the dietitians in the special operations community are in this program. And the title of the talk was Actionable Items for Hormone Optimization in the Warfighter Community. And I think there's a lot of carryover um, with this community as well, in that um, you're expecting things like your sleep schedule to be off, or you're expecting to be in a food desert. So then you plan ahead in order to have like the least bad scenario, if you will. That's some of the circum uh, the ways we can circumvent some of the struggles we face as law enforcement. For example, meal prepping or um, thinking about how to um, like plan around a long shift. Sometimes, like obviously, sometimes it's just um, you know you get called in or whatnot, and um, you know uh, practicing obstetrics is similar. So if you know you could be after you could be doing podcasts all day and seeing patients. And then you get the kids put to bed or whatnot, and then your patient goes into labor. So then, yep, you just gotta gotta get up, stay up all night, and deliver the baby or do the C-section or whatnot. So there there is some analogies in other professions as well. Sometimes you just literally can't plan ahead. So when that's the case, knowing things like you can somewhat stockpile sleep, but you can't really ever truly catch up on it, um, and then getting other actionable lifestyle and supplementation advice again for sleep a good example is getting first thing in the morning sunlight even on your off days um, thinking about both your cortisol circadian rhythm and your melatonin circadian rhythm and then considering supplementation like magnesium or l-theanine um, before jumping to things like high doses of melatonin um, things like that are certainly actionable or even things like um, knowing that people metabolize melatonin at different rates so somebody might be able to take a high dose of melatonin and not have effects the next day, but another individual might take just five milligrams of melatonin and have a deleterious outcome the next day. I think that police officers need to start having a recognition of the impact that their cognitive abilities and these situations that they're handed to make these rapid unfolding decisions very quickly, how they're affected on, on their lack of sleep and their poor diet. Can you touch on that a little bit? Sleep and diet are my two pillars. So the, the pillars are diet and exercise, and those are really the most powerful pillars. And then sleep, stress, sunlight, which encompasses being outside, spirit, social. Um, and all of these things are, again, more powerful than any medication or supplement. But when your diet and exercise is off, often you develop metabolic syndrome or your ratio of essential fatty acids or amino acids is off. So after you develop that, your insulin is high, you become insulin resistant. Your testosterone drops, effort doesn't feel as good, your dopaminergic activity drops, um, so you're not as motivated. So you want effort to feel good. Um, it, it is a profession with very high levels of effort, so you want to have an optimal testosterone. In general, I consider that a total testosterone of at least 550, and you want your free testosterone to also be high, at least 15. You also want your um, natural dopaminergic system. Think of that as the neurotransmitter hormone combination that makes you particularly motivated and focused. So you can currently want that to be high. Dopamine and testosterone are close cousins. So um, thinking about strategies to prevent metabolic syndrome, to maintain a good macronutrient profile of your diet, um, those are particularly important. I would say the top three disruptors or cause of Suboptimal testosterone would be metabolic syndrome, which is insulin resistance, high body fat, losing lean body mass, sleep disruption, most notably sleep apnea, and then a, a, like other andropausal or adrenopausal changes where it's just over a period of time. And for whatever reason, the adrenals and the testes stop functioning as well for a multitude of reasons. Wow, it's interesting. So every person that's listening to this, um, even females, can check those boxes to see, you know, am I insulin resistant? And just getting your normal labs at a doctor is not going to tell you this. So if they just do a, 
Um, a CMP is kind of a normal lab that you get, which is a fasting glucose. You can have a totally normal fasting glucose, but an elevated A1C and a very elevated fasting insulin. What are some ways that people can naturally increase testosterone? One of the best ways um, for about 70% of Americans, which have some degree of metabolic dysfunction, is just decreasing the amount of calories, especially carbohydrate calories. So if you decrease fat calories significantly, that will not be helpful for your testosterone. But most individuals can increase testosterone, both total and free, simply by decreasing their caloric intake. Now, um, there's a difference between caloric density of foods and nutrient density of foods. So you want foods of relatively low caloric density and foods of relatively high nutrient density. Now, uh, carbohydrates can be opposed or unopposed. And uh, basically what this means is that if you're consuming a bunch of carbs, you want to consume them with fiber, protein, and fat. So a good example of a carbohydrate not to consume is carbohydrates in like apple juice or orange juice or even sweet tea. So that's just sugar. My favorite diet, and again, there's no perfect diet, but my favorite one for hormone health for most people is the zero liquid calorie diet. So, um, you know, maybe watch your carbs that you're eating and food as well. But if you eliminate all liquid calories with the exception of one protein shake in the morning, that single intervention can have a huge payoff. If I could reach through this screen and hug you right now, <clears throat> I would, because a lot of people will come to me and ask me questions about, I don't know, I guess when you start having some success in some level, whether it be physically, mentally, um, uh, business-wise, people have questions. And I'm certainly glad to at least give my experience and my take on things. And you know, I say to people, you know, often, and I've said this on this podcast before, I think people jump into these lifestyle changes just way too hard. And maybe just turn the dial up a little by little, you'd see significant change. And the first thing I tell people is eliminate everything except water. You shouldn't be having anything except water. And you'd be surprised. We literally had somebody that I know lost 20 pounds in about a month and a half. And I said, well, how'd you do it? Like, literally, I just drank water only. And it's amazing uh, what just that intervention, which I couldn't agree with more, uh, will have an impact on people's health. It's it's just phenomenal. Um, exercising, heavy weight lifting, cardio, which one's better if you had to choose one? Is there a good mixture of both? And I also want to say, I find it very interesting that as somebody who's interested in health and mental health and diet, man, there just seems to be so many people out there with so many different theories on everything. How do we know, we'll go back to the weightlifting and versus, versus aerobic, how do we know which one is for us? How do we discern it? What are, what are all people in agreement with in your profession when it comes to health? And those are some of the questions I have there because these are things I think about all the time. Yeah, the common denominator of what you should do regarding exercise is, um, and this is for hormonal health or for preventing pathology, whether it's primary care or preventive medicine or health optimization. Everyone should have a movement pastime to have to last a lifetime. Some people, uh, you know, it's the same as diet. Some people just, regardless of trying to form a habit to like something, um, specifically talking about exercise, some people will never enjoy resistance training as much. Now, if you optimize your androgen profile, even for females, then it's much more likely that that effort doing resistance training will feel good. However, um, even a simple pastime of like walking or walking while you play frisbee golf, everybody can find something that they like where they are moving their body and at least getting some sort of aerobic and hopefully anaerobic exercise. That being said, the law of diminishing returns applies. So your first, uh, you know, 20%, uh, like let's say you do uh, two days a week of anaerobic, you're going to get 80% of the benefit from just the first 20% of intervention. The same is said of aerobic. So I consider a good baseline regimen at least two days a week of aerobic, at least two days a week of anaerobic. We see anaerobic people just, so we're every clear, it's weightlifting. Correct. Um, resistance training of some sort where uh, hopefully you are building up lean metabolically active muscle tissue. So you're preventing what we call sarcopenia. If you look at the meta-analyses for um, uh, 
and this is in like the clinical literature, academic journals, if you follow the flow chart down of uh, hormone pathology, low testosterone, high estrogen, et cetera, metabolic syndrome, sarcopenia is actually pretty high up in the area. Osteopenia is lower bone mass. And then sarcopenia is lower muscle mass. Often you have both before you develop diseases like diabetes, hypertension, or hypercholesterolemia. That's good stuff to know. I'm hopefully people will really take some value in that and understand what you're what you're trying to explain and the importance and the significance of what that means to long term health. Can somebody work out too much? It's possible. Um, I recently did a podcast with Rich Roll. And in his community, he runs like ultra marathons and things like that. In his community, there are certainly people that do, but for 98% of people, overtraining is not an issue. Becoming injured at the beginning of training can be an issue, but not overtraining. Yeah, I, I was back on my my game here, but pretty steadily getting two heavy power lifting sessions in a day, one in the morning, very early. And one typically when I get home at night, um, I kept that momentum going. I would say about 85% over uh, a complete year. Um, obviously there had to be margin for error and, uh, and room to miss because I have many children and life happens at times and not always near a, a, and again, my home gym makes it very easy for me to accomplish this. I don't have to go to the gym to do this. You know, you'll hear people say things like, don't you think that's a lot? I got to tell you, I never felt better in my life. Two a day training is certainly possible, especially for a well-trained athlete. I wouldn't necessarily recommend it to start off with, but you could also consider two a days. If you took like a really brisk 20 minute walk after every single dinner, I kind of consider that an exercise session. I'm actually looking at now, including cardio more into my program. And for a number of reasons, the first one is, is I feel like my endurance level in a cardiovascular sense might be a little bit low. So I'm like, maybe I should jump on the bike because I have bad knees. I'm like, maybe I should jump on the bike for 20 minutes, three times a week. What's your thoughts on that? 20 minutes, three times a week. That's where you're getting the most bang for the buck. I consider 20 minutes, three times a week, kind of a minimum. Um, I would, I would also put the caveat, um, you know, you don't net this is, this should not be all vigorous exercise. So if you're not well-trained cardiovascularly, trying to do uh, three or more cardiovascular exercise episodes at uh, full capacity, so like very high intensity is going to be difficult. And it's also going to cause you to be more tired during the day, perhaps, you know, affect your cognitive performance and also cause your resistance training um, to not be as well. So I would say in general, one very vigorous cardiovascular session, and then two or more in kind of like a low zone, like zone two, that's where your heart rate's a little bit above a hundred and, uh, it's great for your health in general, but it's not going to make you tired or, or overly fatigued. So how many times a week should we be getting the heart rate up at least three times, um, every single day if possible, but at least three different times, you want your heart rate to be significantly high. At least one time, um, very vigorous exercise of some sort. I guess we'll kind of make this a little bit about me for the moment. I recently uh, had a, a couple months ago, I'll be 41 next month, um, but I had blood work done. It's this whole test they do in the state of New Jersey called the Captain James Buccio test. And it's for first responders. And they do a complete under the hood check of everything, right? And I met a guy recently in a class and he is actually dealing with colon cancer. And he's like, hey, listen, um, you should go get checked, dude. He's like, because I wish I would have gotten checked. And I was too embarrassed because, but the shit that I'm dealing with now, he's like, they are cutting shit out of me left and right. And it could have been prevented. So what's your thoughts on some of that stuff? And then I'll go on to my, continue to tell you the story about some of my results that I got back from my, my tests. I am a very aggressive advocate of preventive medicine and screening in general. I would say at minimum, start thinking about colon cancer screening at 40. Okay. There are many ways to do it. You can just do a stool sample as well. Um, you should be thinking about everything. So the prostate, the colon, the lungs, there's other cancer screenings like grail testing, which is more promising, especially as uh, time passes. But, um, you know, at, 
and I've had this kind of debate before since I do a lot of health optimization. And the first part of health optimization is true preventive medicine. So the first thing that um, you know you do with your car as well is you make sure it's not going to break down. It's important. I guess back to this thing. So the doctor was quite impressed with my results, which I was happy to hear. Uh, 41 or 41. I had a good testosterone read. He made me, I think he might've pumped my brain up a little bit to get me excited, but if almost 41, I was a 609. Is that decent? Yeah. I usually consider anything over about 500. You're not going to have that much more athletic or cognitive benefit from naturally optimizing past that. I was, I was pumped. Cause he's like, you want the test therapy? And I'm like, nah, he's like, this is, I wish I was 41 and that's my testosterone level. I'm like, if your job was to try to make me feel better about myself, you're fucking getting an A right now because this is great. But he did have concerns about some of my diet. So he said to me, what kind of diet are you on? And I said, well, essentially I'm trying out uh, a little more of a high fat, high protein diet, almost no carbohydrates. And he said, well, some of the things we're seeing in your heart or in your blood work are the things that we see associated with heart attacks. So high bad cholesterol. And he said, you guys are thinking about different things to eat. So I started taking uh, omega-3 pills now, um, but I am still continuing to try to figure out what my diet is going to be. I have a very interesting schedule as I travel a lot, but can you speak to some of that? What causes some of that stuff? And he said, you know, what are the things you're eating? And I'm like, eggs, you know, anything. Like I try to stay with processed foods, but like you name it, like dark chicken, red meats, like, but, you know, like not processed red meats, like, or minimally processed red meats. I'm, I'm, I'm having grass fed ribeyes and things like that. And I'll be honest with you, a lot of my uh, decisions and the way I tailored my programs, one to my liking, but two, and I probably should have read the whole book and I'm back in it again, but it was two meals a day by Mark Sisson. Yeah. And uh, I started just taking off with it and going with the things he said I heard already. And then I was like, oh, wait, I think I missed some shit here. So could you speak to some of the things that I just brought up? Yeah, the devil's kind of in the details. A lot of it's a balance between quality of life and quantity of life. So there's this idea that some people just want a very long lifespan, just chronologically, they want to make it to 90 or 100. And then some people have an idea, they just want a very long health span. So they just want to die healthy. I tend to be in that group. But um, many of the dietary interventions, for example, consuming dairy and meat, they make it very easy for you to have an, a more optimal hormone profile. For example, if you were vegan, then it'd be much more likely that you were deficient in iron and vitamin B12 and low on testosterone. However, that being said, genetically over the past several thousand years, humans have basically been selected out to just reproduce, make it into the 40s. Often the average lifespan was in the 40s and many people would die of bleeding out and a lot of specifically females would die of postpartum hemorrhage. So a lot of these things like elevated lipoprotein A, which is like a, a lipoprotein that's associated with heart attacks, and perhaps even ApoB, which is the specific particle in bad cholesterol that you want to decrease in order to decrease your heart attack risk. A lot of these things are theorized to help with blood clotting. So basically, most likely, a lot of our ancestors, mine as well, I have genetically high cholesterol too because a lot of it's just genetic, it conveys an advantage. Almost like some people have sickle cell anemia, which decreases their chance of malaria. It's the same thing for cholesterol. So over the last several thousand years, um, humans tended not to reproduce because they died in childbirth or died of bleeding out. Um, fortunately, I guess that's a good problem to have. We live such long lives now due to advances in technology, better like care of uh, really bleeding and circulation, ABCs, and then also antibiotics, that we have the problem that we live so long that plaque starts to build up because we do clot so well and we do form plaque so well in the arteries that now our brains are devoid of oxygen and we get ischemic uh, neurodegenerative disease, heart attacks, and strokes. So the balance between that is trying to have the best of both worlds, where you kind of have two different options. One, and I'm as natural as they come, but at the end of the day, the net most natural thing is to turn to dust and die. So um, one is you can continue your like relatively natural, uh, intuitive eating, you know, continue eating saturated fat, continue eating cholesterol, and consider attenuating those risks with medications or supplements, which are the same. One's prescribed, one's not. Both have effects on pharmacologic effects on the body. The other one is to drastically change your diet and lifestyle 
so that that attenuates the risk in and of itself and then deal with the sequela of that. So it's not necessarily the case for everybody, but in your case, perhaps if you changed your diet specifically to decrease your cardiovascular disease risk, your lean body mass and or your quality of life very well may decrease. The same modern science that gave us this problem kind of gives us the solution, but knowing every risk and benefit of both of those strategies is something that the person should chat about with their doctor. Yeah, unfortunately that I think we're all aware here on this podcast, me and you, and Frank, you sitting behind me over here, chatting with a doctor or somebody who has a doctorate doesn't mean they actually know what the fuck they're talking about. And you know that, and you don't got to say that because I know medically you can't say shit like that in professional. But when you say supplements to uh, try to adjust some of these LDL issues, which supplements were you talking about? Maybe if other people are dealing with this, and again, if you're somebody like me, this is going to provide a lot of value for you. But I think overall, I, I, I have been taking omega-3. Uh, in the morning and at night, two pills a day. I, I take a multivitamin a day. That's all I take. I would say the number one supplement that has the best clinical evidence of preventing ASCVD, think of that as heart attacks and strokes. And then the most insidious one that I wouldn't want is ischemic dementia. That's basically just you have plaque in the small arteries of your brain, and then you get dementia because of it and cognitive impairment of age. So is think that directly like a, tied to a diet? It can be, but it's a lot just tied to high amounts of sticky cholesterol particles. Interesting. That's one of the things I tell people to always keep in mind because a lot of people say, you know, I'll take a heart attack or a stroke, you know, um, maybe a, it'll kill me in my sleep and hopefully not maim me for life. But um, that's another outcome of just like letting atherogenic particles, which is again, the sticky cholesterol particles run high is slightly more likely to have... Um, your brain slowly die and shrink up because of lack of oxygen. Um, more likely if you have like really high levels of nicotine use over a long time and uh, high levels of inflammation. But anyway, not to get off on too much of a rabbit trail. Some of the supplements that you can consider, the number one would be EPA. EPA is a specific omega-3. So if you're looking at omega-3s or fish oil, taking fish oil actually slightly increases the risk of something called AFib, especially in very high amounts. But if you take two grams, which is 2,000 milligrams a day of EPA specifically, then we do know that this is going to decrease the outcomes like heart attack and stroke and help your brain be oxygenated. There's many other things that can help. One thing to keep in mind is if you're doing anything to increase or optimize your testosterone, that's also a cholesterol medicine. There's an enzyme that's called HMGCUA reductase. Testosterone increases the enzyme a lot of lipid medications decrease the enzyme. And then depending on your genetics, you just have different um, levels of activity. So one of the ways I see it is you want to have a nice medium activity. You don't necessarily want to crush it to nothing um, in most cases. And you don't. You also don't want it to be a super, super high activity. So if you're on something like TRT or even just naturally optimizing your testosterone, your bad lipid particles will very likely increase. So using supplements like uh, red yeast rice, which is kind of a natural statin, although it can increase your inflammation, um, or citrus bergamot, or other things to bring it down to a normal level, or uh, things like non-lipophilic statins. Those are statins that can't cross the blood-brain barrier, so they can't cause brain fog that some people hear about, um, especially with intermittent dosing, so it's less likely to cause muscle aches. Again, bringing that enzyme level down to a a more normal medium level is very reasonable and is usually the best of both worlds. First question is, is there anything else that you can get besides a circulatory test for an arterial scan to see if you are actually building plaque prematurely before actually having a fucking heart attack? Yeah. Um, many people know about calcium scores that detects calcified plaque. It does not detect uncalcified plaque. To detect uncalcified plaque, you need to have what's called a CCTA, which is basically a CAT scan with dye. The dye goes through your artery and you see if they're blocked. Is it common for people to get this done? Does insurance cover it? Is it easy to find a scan like this? Do you need a qualified professional to look at it or is it some pretty simple shit? Insurance usually does not cover any of this. So um, as it's like kind of ironic. They usually don't cover true preventive medicine screening. It is relatively difficult to do without a doctor that is willing to order it. One of the companies that I use is called Clearly. Uh, you know, like I don't get any kickback from them or whatnot, but 
I have several places where I order these scans on patients that I think are good candidates. I don't order the scan on someone that I think is very low risk. Um, so usually medium to medium high risk, I would order the scan. And often I start with a calcium score, just with a caveat, a calcium score of zero does not mean you don't have any plaque. Um, the well, well respected and esteemed bodybuilder, John Meadows had a very low calcium score as well. And he sadly passed away. Uh, I believe he both had pulmonary blood clots and also a heart attack, but um, it's just kind of a warning that a calcium score that is low does not mean you do not have unstable plaque that you should worry about. Why would he, somebody who's in shape like the way they are, what do you think led to somebody's heart attack? And I, it's not the first time I've heard that somebody who is what we'd see to appear to be in top peak physical condition uh, has these heart attacks. And I'm I'm going to guess without any detriment or slander to his family or him or anybody like that, that would you suspect there could have been some kind of, uh, I don't know, some kind of enhanced medicines used earlier on. And I say medicine for the lack of a better term of saying steroids. That very well could be the case. I believe he was a professional bodybuilder. I usually just assume that with any professional bodybuilder and um, with many, many athletes, that it is certainly possible that uh, anabolic steroids or at least performance enhancing drugs are part of the regimen in order to perform. That being said, I believe with his case, and this could be wrong, but I believe he had a hypercoagulability disorder called factor five laden, mm -hmm. which is one of the most common ones. It's where a blood clotting factor, factor five, and this is very common in Caucasians, um, has abnormal activity and leads to a predisposition of blood clots. How do you I have an tell extremely, extremely low threshold for testing this? And I test it in many, many individuals. I think it's only like 25 or $30 to test. And, uh, I believe more than 1% of individuals of Caucasians have it. So oh, very low threshold, depending on your like genetic heritage and whatnot, there's different things. For example, for other heritage, abnormal levels of factor eight are more common. Um, so there's, there's lots of things to think about, especially before considering some performance enhancing compound, whether it's for athletic performance or cognitive performance. How do you tell when somebody's high risk versus medium risk, as you said before? There's a couple of ways. The traditional way is called a 10 year ASCVD tool. So you can Google it and go to MD calc and put in to see what your 10 year risk is, but I don't care. Um, well, I do care what my 10-year risk is, but I care more than just the 10-year risk. So I want to know my lifetime risk. And I don't just want to know my lifetime risk of heart attack and stroke. I want to know my lifetime risk of, again, like that ischemic dementia, the low oxygen dementia due to plaque. So that's a decent way to do it. You can also stratify based on other things like your CRP, which is your level of inflammation, your ApoB, which is the main concerning cholesterol particle, technically a lipoprotein. Some people um, are like esoteric about that. And then also um, depending on your insulin resistance. For example, if you're pre-diabetic or have had fasting insulin over about 10, you're significantly higher risk, even with everything else being the same. How do you know or learn more about yourself? Like for example, you know, I, I, I try to keep myself in shape. I think it's clear. Uh, this is not me bragging, just something that's a top priority for me. Uh, I got to tell you to people all the time. I'm like, man, I feel better at 41 than I did at 19. I'm not kidding you. I feel fucking phenomenal outside of the injuries that have sustained the line of duty. Um, I feel great. Like I really do. I'm, and people now see me seven years after I've retired from the police force and they'll say, you look younger than you did when you left here. How is that possible? And you know, tell them, I'm not eating diner food. I'm much more regimented. I get appropriate sleep. They said, what about your stress level? You think it's gone? I'm like, well, I run a essentially what could be the country's largest police training company. So if you think stress has disappeared, uh, it's just a different kind of problem now. And these ones are a little more nail biting, to be quite honest with you, when you understand at an older age what you're looking at. But are there different body types? Do people react to different foods differently? And how do we figure out which kind of person we are? Genetics are highly, highly variable. So you know, when a car comes off the assembly line, we test it, we hook up with the computer, we see if there's any defects, and then they usually fix that at the factory. Um, we kind of do the same thing when things are refurbished for electronics as well. We hook it up, we fix any defects. Defects are common. Sometimes they're uh, advantageous and sometimes they are disadvantageous. So it does depend on the person. There's not like rigid body types that you are in this group no matter what, and there's 
same thing. There's not genetics to where like you are doomed to get type two diabetes and insulin resistance. There's certainly genetics to where you're more predisposed to that. Knowing that you need to look at both subjective and objective findings. And what that means is how you feel, your biofeedback, how you're doing, what symptoms you have, plus objective feedbacks. That's like quantified variables. That's like labs, imaging, diagnostic workups, hormone tests. And if people look at uh, either follow my Instagram or my clinic or my website, uh, I routinely put like what my recommended lab panels are. And eventually I'll have ways where people can just click and order it and they can look and it'll spit out. There's a lot of services that do this as well. Um, a lot of them are just looking for profit. They're not necessarily good, but one particularly interesting one for age is called epigenetic aging or pheno age. There's a couple different ways that um, it can be termed, but basically it looks at a lot of different biomarkers and it tells you like what age your cells are right now or what age your DNA is. It can change a lot, but I would assume that, and they've done studies, how young you look. For example, you right now at 41, it's likely that your DNA pheno age or your epigenetic age would be in the 20s or perhaps 30. Whereas previously, your age could be much higher. Dr. David Sinclair is another scientist. He's a scientist that talks about this as well. It's not the only test that you should get, but it's definitely a good um, like proxy variable of how you've been living. So essentially measuring your, your biological age versus what they told you on your birth certificate. Yeah, it's helpful. Um, now, it doesn't tell you exactly what to do. So including those other biomarkers, for example, looking at your gut microbiome, looking at your hormones, looking at your inflammation levels, you also want to do that. But it's a good place to know to start. If we're curious about who we are, what our bodies react to, and essentially getting something optimal, maybe meeting with a professional and saying, this is what I'd like to look like, this is what I want to achieve. What kind of professional should we be seeking in this in this uh, realm? And do different people in different stages of physical fitness need to really consider uh, which kind of professionals they seek? And here's why I ask that. I have been searching, and sometimes I'll see somebody who is, you know, advertising one sports and the other one is like, hey, here are 16 things that I deal with on designing you a diet. And a lot of it's like hypertension, diabetes, pre-diabetic, um, you know, cognitive improvement. So who do we look for and how does that change? And how do we make sure somebody's qualified to be the person to help us with that? It's actually pretty similar to looking for like a coach or a mechanic or perhaps a trainer as well is, um, you look around online and try to vet their sources. It can be difficult to do, especially in a world where there's um, a wide heterogeneous um, like choice that you can look for like a hormone expert, functional medicine expert, gut expert, this or that. But going to a clinic that is supervised by an MD or a DO is a great start. Again, it does not mean that it's going to be a good one. Um, if the MD or DO is board certified in preventive medicine, like my colleague, Taylor Martin, who trained at Johns Hopkins or board certified in obesity medicine, like myself, then uh, preventive medicine and obesity medicine is a great place to start, especially if that's one of the things that um, like the emphasis is in. I think that everybody should also find a GP or a, like a primary care in their own area. In addition to that, having a provider that gives advice via telemedicine, which my company also happens to do, um, is very reasonable. If you're looking for the answer to a question, you don't just ask who you think like the smartest kid is in the room, or you don't just ask the kid that is next to you, like their desk is next to you, unless it, you know, assuming this is open book, you ask everybody. And you're most likely to get the best, most balanced answer that way. A lot of people look for a healthcare provider that will tell them what they already want to be true. So I think avoiding that is also an important aspect of choosing a healthcare provider. Let's take me for example. Again, I'll make it a little more selfish too, but maybe some people are kind of in the same boat. I think people are in the same boat. I mean, typically I'm somebody who does exercise quite frequently. Um, and I seem to be stuck in that point of, and I can certainly sit here and admit to you some of my faults and what I think the reasons are for some of the behaviors that I'm, that I'm uh, engaging in no doubt my mind contribute. I'm not somebody who's pretending like I don't do things that I shouldn't be doing with food. Um, 
But where do you go from? I'm almost there. I really want to look, have that real nice shred look. Clearly, I'm a muscular guy, but I still kind of have that last layer that I just can't seem to shake. And that's a, that's a, for me, it seems like that's maybe the hardest thing to try to achieve is look, I, I don't look obese and uh, people certainly can see me and see that I'm a, I'm, I'm a muscular guy, but to get to that shred, to that look that everybody wants to look like, and don't kid yourself, everybody wants to look like that. What are some, some things we can take into account? We're trying to get to that last uh, goal of, of results. I'd say when you're looking at a body composition outcome, think about another analogy. Think about someone doing a, a 600 pound deadlift or running a uh, four minute mile or four, four and a half minute mile, depending on like what genetics you've started with and depending on your nurture throughout your childhood, if you're an individual and you're no longer developing, you may have a greater or lesser chance of realistically getting there without um, huge inputs and variables changing. Now, that being said, a lot of times you can get halfway there or 80% the way there. And a lot of people can get there, especially individuals who haven't tried a lot of the lifestyle interventions. But for some people, it's important to remain realistic. Um, being single digit body fat for some males, especially if your body fat set point has been um, you know, at 15 to 20%, for a couple decades, that is going to be very hard to maintain. Now, it's likely that you can get there temporarily, but it could cause other things to kind of go haywire. That being said, um, it just kind of depends on the individual. So the law of diminishing returns definitely applies in medicine. If you're thinking about your simple interventions like your lifestyle pillars, L-carnitine, even injectable L-carnitine, creatine, um, you know, uh, nutrient timing, nutrient partitioning, Deploying these things can likely get most people half the way there. We'll see. I'm going to switch the topic completely. I appreciate that. Um, you've actually saved me a lot of time of internet research, where I also go on to internet research with a uh, with discretion and try to really think: Does this make sense? And you know, fortunately enough, I'm somebody who consumes a lot of educational material, especially in this realm. But it was very interesting to me. This is that the first time I've heard you speak? Uh, that's why we invited you on the podcast. I, th- I thought your other interviews were very, very thoughtful and have helped me. So just know that none of the things that you do are in vain. Uh, even if there's not some kind of procurement of revenue, certainly the value you're giving back to the human race, at least for me, was impactful. So I just want you to know that and appreciate you taking the time. And, I, heard and you talk I appreciate about it. it. And that's kind of why I do it is because I feel like I had, I had been giving these spiels to a lot of my patients one-on-one. And this is a very efficient way to help bring evidence-based actionable items for health and hormone health to the public free of cost. So I think it helps a lot of people. And uh, I think eventually it will pay off for me as well. No question about it. Yeah. And listen, you know, people always say, uh, you guys are for profit at Street Cop Training. Well, we certainly are. There's no question about it. We are running a company. It's the lifeblood of the company. Nobody's pretending I work seven days a week. I do things that most people don't want to do. I was in an airport last night trying to get an earlier flight to get home today to wake up, catch up on things. We're back in the airport tomorrow, right? Guess what? I don't, I just had to readjust the schedule so I can make sure I'm home for my daughter's birthday. You know, like, listen, Yo. I'm paying my dues. So in, in turn, yes, I'd like to be compensated. I'm not, I don't need to drive 16 Lamborghinis, but I'd like to be compensated for the work that I do. And, you know, essentially people really understand what we're trying to do. The more money we procure, the more our goal of reaching more people becomes because when we procure revenue, we could hire more people and we could have more social media presence and spread the word. And people are very thankful and gracious for that. And I don't think anybody has qualms with that, but as long as people are understanding how that works and why that works that, yeah, yeah. I mean, like, believe me, I'm I'm here to make money as well. There's no question about it, but that's not why I do this. It's the only thing I do it for. And I think that's something we get back consistently. And I'm sure you get it as well as that we know you're genuine. We know you're not greedy. We understand why you need to be compensated. And we know that you guys at this company just really lead with your hearts and always do the right thing. And the rumors do not fall to the wayside. It's clear that you guys certainly show up when you need to at all times, no cost. But I'm going to switch this just a little bit. Thank you, by the way. And uh, I I try to be as genuine as possible. I've said on other podcasts before, I got into this because it was a hobby. Um, 
I, I was chatting with Derek from More Plates, More Dates, and I gave him a couple different cases of uh, patients I had taken care of. And this was just something fun that I did in my free time. So, uh, you That's know, awesome, talking dude. with like choosing to leave my previous practice and completely go out on my own and have no guarantee. And, um, you know, it's like your eight brain kind of takes over. And right as you're grasping that last branch, you, you're building simultaneously, you're leaving that branch of that huge corporation hospital chain, building that new tree for not only a branch for you to take hold of, but also your employees. So I think uh, we're in pretty similar positions regarding no that. No question about it, dude. People don't realize that. And there's a, there's an analogy I think you might like. I don't know if you've ever heard the this um, it's a small sonnet of some sense, uh, uh, but it's something called the river of fear. And I'll be honest with you, I'm so fucking angry of where I didn't hear this because I wanted to get it like painted on the wall in here. But essentially how it goes is, uh, we stand on the bank of the river of fear, can't see across it. It's a very gloomy river. And, you know, some people decide to jump in and start swimming, not knowing how wide the river is, but uh, realizing that once they're in and they start to swim, they the river's not as wide as they thought it was. And on the other side is paradise. And only those who are bold enough to jump into the river and start swimming across will actually get to experience the paradise on the other side. And you know, essentially, obviously, that's something that is regarding anxiety associated with moving and doing uncomfortable shit. And there are a lot of things that once you start to get recognition like yourself, that people will sling and cast mud your way and will criticize the work that you're doing. And, you know, you'll learn pretty quickly that you got to ignore the noise and just, I'll be honest with you, dude, if I, if I wasn't doing this, I think I'd probably do something in your field. I, but I'm also not as smart as you are. So you're very articulate. Your brain probably works a little bit differently than mine. Um, I have extreme attention deficit disorder. I am, I can theorize a lot of things. I'm really good at creating new shit. Uh, but when it comes to, but I, I have a passion for it too. I really find the things that you're doing very interesting and very, it's very admirable. Thank you. I, I think the passion we share also kind of like makes us more, more likely to be in a similar situation. So I like to say, you don't necessarily want to be the first wildebeest or zebra into the Nile, but if you are one of the first, it feels very good. To me, when I see you, it's one of those professions that there is a human association of you trying to do something better for the world. And especially in a time where we live in a society where I don't know what the statistics are, but people are fucking fat. They're obese and they're dying and they're sick. And what they're doing is living these very medicated lives later on. and sedentary and i have people that i know that literally are young in the sense of the uh, sense of the, the word compared to what it once was and can't do anything literally just can't be included in certain activities because they are not mobile enough at a very young age and i have other people that i know that are same ages and kayak in the ocean every day right sure. like so i i put a lot of thought into that and i try to really invest in myself essentially understanding that I'm 40, right? I'm 30 years away from being 70, but I don't want to look at myself at 70. I just thought in the airport last night, I was picking up a very, very heavy luggage. So it's like 68 pounds per luggage because I carry gear when I travel. I said, man, imagine being like 30 years from now, I'm looking around, like not being able to pick up just 70 pounds. I don't yeah. want that to be me. I don't want that to be me. And I'm going to do everything I can within my power outside of some force that I can't control to ensure that 30 years from now, I'm yanking this fucking thing right off the the turnstile and throwing it down just like I am today. Um, but before we end this thing, I just want to ask you, because this is a, a epidemic in law enforcement, and it's actually such an epidemic that it's commonly associated as humorous, which it kind of is at times, but the energy drinks in law enforcement, this prolonged uh, state of awakeness where they're trying to perform as law enforcement officers, it's tough. Uh, but also just slamming Red Bulls and, and these bangs. What kind of effects does that have on people? It obviously depends on the energy drink. If it's caffeine, it's exogenously mimicking your adenosine signaling. So you're completely counteracting one of your natural wakefulness and sleep cycles. So it is certainly not optimal. In fact, after about a month, the beneficial effect wears off. And you kind of like get sensitized to it, if that makes sense. Interesting. So if someone's going to do that, cycling on and cycling off, stimulants can help. 
but there's many other types of stimulants. There's dopaminergic stimulants, there's noradrenergic stimulants. So there's many different strategies to help with this. Um, that being said, I'm not sure if it's officially classified as an epidemic. Obesity is officially classified as an epidemic, according to our government. But yeah, I would say, uh, think about your stimulant or your nootropic regimen. It, there isn't like a, a perfect go-to for everyone, but if you can get to a point where you're utilizing lower amounts of caffeine and using other nootropics or stimulants at least a couple days a week, that's going to give you way more bang for the buck long run. Is it better to go for the cup of black coffee or the, or the cup of tea versus sucking down one of these energy drinks? In most cases, it is. There is a huge variation in the contents of energy drinks. Um, they are not extremely tightly regulated. So the ingredient list for not only energy drinks, but supplements in general often has um, things in them. Uh, for example, like uh, pseudo, like similar to amphetamines, they have things in them that we just don't realize. So the safe way to go about it is use reputable brands and stick to basic things like coffee or uh, even like lion's mane, things like that. Is coffee okay to drink? Yeah. Um, a good rule of thumb is depending on how you how fast you metabolize caffeine, the average person around 300 mg a day um, is, is reasonable. Now on a day that you don't need it, ideally you would drink very little, perhaps only one cup or only 60 milligrams. But on a day when you do need it, Obviously, it works. That's why it's uh, utilized or abused. Um, is it does help, but um, timing it when you need it the most is important. That's very interesting, dude. I have actually found that when I decided to start drinking coffee, maybe four or five years ago, because uh, I was experimenting with life hacks. So I'm like, hey, let me try this coffee thing. I never touched this stuff, and uh, I just enjoy it now. And it's not even about the caffeine hit on it. It's actually just the flavor of coffee that I'm really, really into. Um, sometimes, not often, I will overdo it. But I don't drink ever in my life more than two cups a day. So I've one. I usually try to let my circadian rhythm wake up in the morning, 60 to 90 minutes, depending on what my day looks like. I wake up, I blast every light. My kids wake up. It's like waking up in the middle of the fucking day. They're like, what is going on here? And yes. they know I'm awake. I mean, the house is bright, brother. I keep it like everything is like LED, white light blasting as soon as i wake up everything goes on that's how it should be yeah well that's what i try to do and if 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 it's the summer i try to get outside and do some things in the backyard for 10 minutes to try to get the natural sunlight into my face and then you know typically maybe an hour after i cook breakfast for everybody uh 290 minutes i'll have a cup of coffee before i work out i actually find that to be a good hack for me i get a little more of a boost uh with the workout just straight black and then i typically have another cup of coffee after lunch i don't touch coffee after that so maybe one o'clock, one thirty in the afternoon, I'll have whatever meal I'm going to have and I'll have a cup of coffee because I don't want the half-life of it to last into my sleep rhythms at night. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, it's a pretty good regimen. Um, some people take one day off, one day on, add in something like L-tyrosine, which is a precursor to dopamine or an also thyroid hormone. Some people add an alpha GPC or phosphatidylcholine or phosphatidylserine to kind of have the acetylcholinergic response. Um, but that's a pretty good standard regimen for coffee. I think that's extremely reasonable. Well, listen, um, maybe you could tell everybody where they can find you, your website, on social media. I know right as we're done here, I'm going right to it to look at some of the shit that you have because I want to buy some things. My main hub is Instagram, Kyle Gillette, MD. Uh, you can also find me at GilletteHealth.com. And we, uh, I'm at you Gillette spell Gillette. Spell Gillette. Yeah. Gillette is G-I-L-L-E-T-T. -T. So like the razor, but the E shaved off. Although if you put in, <laughs> if you put the E on or whatnot, it'll take you to the same website. If you just go GilletteHealth.com. Did you buy Gillette Health and then had it redirected to the original page? Yeah, I have three different Gillette Health domains. That's smart. I mean, most people are going to spell it the way they see it on the side of the deodorant bottle, yep. right? So either way, it'll bring you to me. Man, I, I could probably talk about this stuff with you for days. I, I find you very endearing. I just want to thank you for taking the time to come out and do this podcast with us. And, and you know, hopefully that we cross paths again in the future. This was phenomenal. Uh, I think that you were a gift to the world. And boy, it would have been a sin if you didn't share that gift with everybody. So uh, in the face of adversity at times or any kind of criticisms that you receive, don't forget that you're bringing a lot of value to a lot of people. And it's important work. And I know that you have enough proof in your history of practicing medicine of how important that proof is. And I'm guessing by people saying 
you change my life. And don't forget, it's a gift, man. It's a gift. And I'm glad you're not ignoring it. I'm glad you didn't go. I'm glad you jumped into the river, brother. And there's anything I can do for you ever. We appreciate you tremendously, brother. Just reach out anytime you need anything. You get a ticket, give me a shout. We'll try to make a call for you. Thank you. Likewise, I really appreciate it. And it's a pleasure to be on the show. Awesome, man. Take care, man. Guys, if you're in an area where you're trying to get to our classes, but we're not close to you, fret not. We actually have on-demand training at streetcop.com. You can take that course online right now, and then you could attend that training in the future at no additional cost. You can redeem your voucher. So you get two for the price of one. We don't want to deny you the ability to take this training now, especially knowing that it can keep you safe at a very minimum, putting bad guys in jail where they belong, and at the maximum going home to your family. Check out streetcop.com for that offer.